Hello and welcome back to video number two for the biomechanical analysis of jumping. For this you will need the slides pertaining to the biomechanical characteristics of jumping, the uh, prac sheet regarding to the biomechanical analysis of the standing board jump, the biomechanics manual as well as the Excel application that allows you to go through your data. So assuming that in the first set of videos you've worked your way through the actual data capturing and digitizing process, this next step will go through the analytics of it all. Okay, so once you've got your biomechanical analysis of jumping Excel sheet open, and assuming you've digitized everything um, and it's working properly, and you've made any corrections if there were any errors, uh, we're going to work our way through a couple of the analytical components. So one of the first things is you'll want to go and assess the joint ranges of motion so on here, there are quite a few different options. Uh, since we're assuming symmetry, uh, left and right sides will be exact exactly the same, so it doesn't really matter which one you choose. Uh, for consistency purposes, we'll look at right hip and knee ranges of motion. So what you can see here, it may look confusing. So if you get confused on anything, we can always play it back and kind of try and make sense of the graphical data. So you'll see here that as the person is about to initiate the jump, there's a certain amount of hip and knee flexion, right? So as you're playing it forward, what you'll see is that the data gets displayed in almost real time, and we have the blue being hip and the orange being the knee. You'll see that as the per person is initiating the jump and just about to leave the ground, the hip and knee move from this flexion state into an extension state. If it reaches complete zero, it means that we've reached complete extension. And you can see here that the hip is pretty much in complete extension. You can see the knee is pretty close to complete extension as well. As the person leaves the ground, um, you can see here that now both the hip and the knee go back towards flexion. It increases quite uh, dramatically, specifically for the knee, more so than the hip. And then the knee goes through extension again. And you can see here it's going to drop back down in preparation for landing but the hip is still in flexion and then the person lands and we have some knee flexion that tends to happen again as the person cushions uh, and, and that's in essence what we have over here um, the next step I'm gonna just leave it here so that we have the full graphical analysis remember this is just time on the on the x-axis so this is as the range of motion changed through time Something that we would be interested in too is the hip and knee joint velocities, right? So this gives us some really important and quite pertinent information about timing differences between, in this case, uh, hip and knee velocities. So you can see here that the peak um, hip and knee extension velocities pretty much occurred at the same time. In essence, it's saying that the hip and the knee extended at uh, near simultaneous times. So again, this is where the theoretical aspects come into play and say, well, what should it be? Is that good? Is it bad? Is it novice? Is it expert? Um, and how does it differentiate? You can see then while the person was in the air, they both went through a certain amount of flexion and then in landing, it went back into extension in terms of the knee some slight extension in terms of uh, extension velocity in terms of the hip, but then we had this rapid flexion of the knee and in, in, in landing. What you'll also notice is that the hip and knee both experience some flexion velocity on landing. And it's quite interesting when you relate that back to the video, uh, this may be attributable to the fact that, or contribute to the fact that the person had some slight velocity still going forward on landing. So if I take this video, and I play it as the person tends to land, right? You'll notice that the hip and knee extension velocities and flexion velocities may still contribute to the slight forward off balance um, motion that we tend to see from this athlete. Something else that we, would be, that we would be interested in is timing differences between, let's say for example, hip um, extension velocity and that of the shoulder joint. So in terms of the shoulder, uh, we would want to look at the shoulder angular velocities, look at timing differences between them two. So in essence, what you would want to see is that the hip 
tends to extend at a faster rate or the hip extension velocity is faster than that of the shoulder but what we see here is the opposite right you'll see here that the shoulder flexion velocity uh, occurs at a time prior to the hip uh, extension velocity so there's a timing difference here what should it be what is it should we change it how do we change it but what is also interesting is that they tend to counterbalance each other so regardless of these timing differences whenever the shoulder is in flexion the hip is in extension when the hip is in flexion the shoulder goes into extension and this is kind of to try and maintain if you think about components of angular momentum angular momentum is a function of the moment of inertia times the angular velocity so since we don't have moment of inertia at this point in time the angular velocity should give us an indication of what the angular momentum should be since it's proportional to that okay so here's some timing differences and we can we can see that again there's some slight uh, velocity in the same direction upon landing which is why again we were saying that uh, earlier when you look at the video the person goes slightly off balance at that point in time good uh, something else that you may want to look at is the center of mass motion so center of mass both in the x and y direction so center of mass in the x direction is displayed first and center of mass in the y direction is displayed so here center of mass in the x direction well the person moved forward so we'd find relative to time that that center of mass has moved forward what is of interest though is to find out where was the center of mass at the instant of takeoff which is right about here so the toe is at a certain distance from where the center of mass would be right which is considered the takeoff distance so at this instant in time frame number 12 where was the center of mass in the x direction and you can see here it's about approximately 1.5 meters just as the person is about to take off right uh, I can use this bottom portion here to find out where was the toe on the 11th frame and um, well, I'll get back to that in a second I can I can kind of click on here as well and see that the toe in the x direction was 0 0.89 meters so I can find the difference between that and the center of mass um, to give that takeoff distance I can then project forward to the instant where the athlete tends to land you can see here it's approximately 2.7 uh, meters right and in this instance the heel was at 2.82 so this would be the landing distance and then the difference between those two would give me the flight distance of the center of mass right here I can see the hor uh, the vertical motion of the center of mass so again if I had to play it back to frame number 12 just when the person is about to take off the height of the center of mass at that instant was 1.16 and let's look at what it was at the peak of its flight as I go forward so here at the peak it was about 1.36 and the difference between those two gives me how high the center of mass moved at that instant in time okay um, what I was saying earlier was I could use this bottom portion to find out the difference between where the toe was upon landing and the toe was upon takeoff so if I was investigating the difference between the 12th frame and the 27th frame that the toe moved approximately 2.1 meters so it gives me a good indication of roughly how far the person jumped and that's the actual motion of the limbs because remember the dif distance that you jumped is from where you took off to where you ultimately landed so technically I should look at where the heel was at landing and that will give me the distance that the person jumped but ultimately the forces that are produced only account for the distance in the center of mass motion talking about forces uh, that's something I may want to look at as well so I look at the ground reaction forces in the y direction I'm going to use the both uh, I'm going to use the same in both instances here just to make it uh, a little bit more clear so here's the center of mass uh, sorry here's the ground reaction forces of the center of mass uh, you can see here that this is the instance of um, while I'm in contact with the ground here's the net forces while I'm in the air and then this is the forces while I'm landing right so you can kind of see that relative to body weight this in this individual weighed about approximately 55 kilograms so 55 is about 
540 odd newtons so if I had to draw a line here I can just insert one actually just for interest sake um, so around about 540 is my body weight right so you can see how much more force I had to generate in order to propel the body into the air and then you can also see how much higher the landing forces are once the athlete make contact with the ground again you'll notice that there's quite a bit of noise in here but if I filter that data it's pretty close to zero which is kind of what we want to see the ground reaction forces tend to go to zero when I'm in the air I'm not making contact with the ground at that point in time right so something that I might want to see is the uh, acceleration of the center of mass while the person uh, well throughout the entire motion actually so center of mass acceleration you should see it mimics the motion of the ground reaction forces because ground reaction forces are in essence dependent on the acceleration of the center of mass right we use Newton's second law in order to calculate that but you can see here that I need to exert a certain amount of acceleration vertically in order to propel myself in the air once I'm in the air if I kind of had to average these values out you kind of see here that it's around about this negative 10 which is kind of the gravitational acceleration right that while I'm in the air the only acceleration acting on the body is the gravitational acceleration and then again I have this change in acceleration upon landing right and we can use all this information to kind of calculate what the ground reaction forces are so again in your analysis you would want to look at each of those uh, particular components again you can look at elbow range of motion elbow velocity elbow acceleration you can look at shoulder a range of motion velocity and acceleration hip and knee so on and so forth so the analysis can be as comprehensive as possible i need you guys to take screenshots of each of these components um, as you are assessing and analyzing it and discussing it in greater detail that's where your uh, prac sheet will come into play right so the biomechanical analysis of the standing board jump will take you through all of those details in terms of what your proper setup should be what your data recording process should be and then the assessment um, of the particular jumper that you are assessing you will then need to construct a training program that would facilitate improved performance based on your analysis okay so the details of that are going to be quite important and will form a comprehensive component of your of your report write-up um, that in essence just covers the basics of what i want you guys to do in this particular prac uh, hopefully all of that makes sense and if you guys have any questions or queries please don't hesitate to come and see me all right thanks for listening